very much so. I'm going to address today the lecture about the urologists dealing with uh, cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm uh, Dr. Serene Gay. I'm a professor of urology in Dakar, Senegal, and the president of the West African College of Surgeons. Uh, you know that Sub-Saharan Africa has so many socioeconomic constraints regarding the demography of more than 1 billion people now, and uh, carrying 25% at least of the global burden of disease with very, very low workforce. And this is the unfortunate to low health expenditure per capita. Uh, many security concerns in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially in Western Central Africa, post Ebola recovery and now hit by the great concern about COVID-19 pandemic outbreak that is closing down everything in the sub-region. And the population in Sub-Saharan Africa is fast growing with uh, for poverty going along with. And unfortunately, in many West Sub-Saharan African countries, there's some kind of malgovernance as mis mismanagement, uh, leading to lack of infrastructure and lack of expertise in both uh, quality and quantity. That is uh, unfortunately worsened by internal and increasingly external brain drain. Many of the health workers are trying to seek for a better place to work and live outside of the continent. So Sub-Saharan Africa population is growing very fast. And in 2020, it is expected that the population will be more than 1 billion and 100 million people. And by 2050, it will be more than 2 billion people in the in the Sub-Saharan Africa, excluding Northern Africa, meaning that Africa will be very well, very populated in the year 2050s. These are, there are some differences between the North African part of Africa as compared to Sub-Saharan Africa. The North African part uh, comprising is Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, uh, and Sudan are not part of WHO Afro, but WHO Imro. And uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is a part of Africa below the Sahara Desert and going up to the Limpopo. And if you compare the two regions, we see that North Africa mainly are, is composed of middle income countries with political stability and, uh, and very well established oncology training programs from Morocco going to Egypt and adequate number of oncologists. Whilst in Sub-Saharan Africa, most of the countries are low income with the recent or recurrent conflict. If you go to Burkina Faso, to to Mali, to many places, there are some ongoing war or tourism. Very few oncology training program, and uh, unfortunately, very an insufficient number of oncologists, and especially surgical oncologists in that part of Africa. When you come to cancer epidemiology in Africa, there are main three main obstacles. One is the underreporting due to lack of tumor registries in many countries underdiagnosis because of lack of clinical infrastructure and lack of training of health workers to be able to, to, to diagnose properly cancer. And the most important problem or the problem, the need is a pathology laboratory that is lacking in many countries in West and Central African subregion. And this will lead to underestimation of true incidence of cancer in Africa. So when you go to any any data coming from IARC or WHO or any other agency, we see that unfortunately what is said as regard to African epidemiology is not really accurate because of lack of um, data collection, lack of uh, uh, accurate reporting. That mean that the, the statistics are not really accurate uh, when it comes to go to those databases. We realize that Africa is going through a growing cancer pandemic with a health system being now dominated by non by non communicable disease that uh, uh, is cancer coming up with diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, and respiratory problem. And cancer is now becoming a very big problem in uh, all Africa and especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it has been 
reported that by year 2030, like in 10 years' time, over 70% of all cancer deaths will occur in low and uh, mid-income countries, including Africa. And African having an increased risk of cancer death due to an uh, exposure to infection that cause cancer. And uh, about 25% of cancer in Africa are linked to some kind of infections. And if you come to this table, you see that regarding to, uh, according to Global Can, by 20, uh, 2030, the, the increase will be more in Africa and the Caribbean than in the old Europe or in the United States. And if you see, look at the six most common cancer, both sexes in the world, in all continents, we see that in Africa, breast cancer is now number one. It used to be cervical cancer, but it's breast cancer. And for male process coming up is now number three. But there are a lot of program, ongoing program uh, to, trying to alleviate the burden of breast and cervical cancer. So I do think that in a few years, like maybe about five years, prostate cancer will come maybe number one, as it is in South America, in North America, and in Australia. And many of these cancers in Africa are linked to cancer, to, to infection, like the cervix, liver, and some not hushing lymphoma in Africa. Going to the statistic and looking at this, this table, we see the, that prostate cancer is number one cancer in male in Africa. And uh, in the compare the, in the urological malignancies, prostate and bladder are the, are, are, are the, are the second most prevalent. That's why I'm going to address in this lecture mostly the two more common genital urinary malignancies that are prostate and uh, bladder cancer. Postal cancer incidence uh, uh, is becoming higher and higher and more important in Africa. And it is estimated that globally in the world uh, that there will be more uh, approximately 1.3 million new cases of cancer uh, in 2018. And uh, prostate cancer becoming uh, almost number three here and uh, number two after lung cancer. But there are some limitations in regard of global can because of the rarity and incomplete tumor registries in sub-Saharan Africa. And most of the figures that are reported are estimates. And if we look at what is reported on global can and what has been demonstrated in Jamaica, in the Caribbean, where prostate cancer is very high, we, look, we think that in Africa, the, the prevalence or the incidence should be much higher than it is reported. And the limitation, there are some limitations in the management of prostate cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa. Number one is the limited knowledge of the disease among African men. Many African men don't know about prostate cancer. And there are late presentation. This is almost all cancer, not only prostate or bladder or male cancer, only all cancer. And one of my friends, uh, Joe Harford from NCI used to say that the key peculiarities of cancer in Africa is number one, late presentation, number two, late presentation, and number three, late presentation. But we do have some cultural factors that are unfortunately not helping to for, for, for cancer management. One is that people consider cancer as a death sentence. When you say people, you have cancer, the person will say that you're going to die. And there are some surgical procedures like amputation are not accepted in many parts of Africa. Like if you want to propose orchiectomy to any male in Southern Africa, you would think about it many times for accepting to go into the procedure. There are lack of adjuvant therapy like hormonal therapy, chemotherapy. The drugs are not usually available. If they are, they are very expensive, but there are some initiatives to facilitate access anti-cancer treatment in many countries like Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, now Nigeria, Mali, and some other countries. And radiation therapy is not equally distributed in Africa. Only few countries in West Africa and few in East Africa and maybe Central Africa have some radiotherapy facilities, but it's coming up. And there are few prostate cancer research going on the continent, going on, on the continent. And the most prominent group is the MATCAP group, which is the male of African descent and customer of the prostate. 
which include many teams from South Africa, Botswana, Uganda, uh, um, uh, Tanzania, Senegal, Nigeria, Ghana, many Caribbean countries, now Cote d'Ivoire and the United States. It is a, it's a very big network of researchers that is looking at uh, etiology and working on molecular epidemiology on prostate cancer in men of African descent. What I say about uh, the epidemiology, it, it has been demonstrated that it's not only in Africa because unfortunately there's a lot of underestimation of the true incidence of prostate cancer worldwide. And it has been seen that even for people operated for BPH, up to 25% BPH being a benign prostate hyperplasia, up to 25% of those patients have malignancies. And uh, in many places, there are no more screening, so people, they come, they have symptomatics. In Sub-Saharan Africa, prostate cancer has some clinical characteristics. We have done some work with the subject, and Ozek Bay in uh, Nigeria, in Shirley Ziegler Johnson, who worked with us, Shonita, we, we shown that uh, we showed that uh, there are some delayed diagnosis and advanced stage. And when patients come to us, unfortunately, for many, many, um, in many, many, many cases, we don't, we cannot uh, even propose any creative uh, treatment because it's so advanced. And this high proportion of prostate related symptoms has been seen too, uh, reported by myself, by Friedland, Osegbe, and, and, and Morgan. In this study, they compare Senegalese, African American, and uh, US uh, Caucasians that was published in urology in 2003, we saw that Senegalese patients come little older, that the mean age was 69, with a mean PSA of 73, whilst in the Americas, the mean PSA is very low. And most of the many patients came at the first diagnosis with bone metastasis already, advanced stage of T3, T4, but mostly T4 than T3. T, 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 after 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 the better assessment, this late presentation is a main peculiarity of prostate cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa. In a pool analysis of uh, about uh, 2,000 men with prostate cancer in the country like Senegal, Nigeria, Togo, Burkina, Kenya, and Tanzania, we show that many patients they come to the hospital with obstructive uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, uh, absolute symptom. While in the United States, most people they go for maybe just uh, like uh, screening or with no symptoms. And the mean PSA, if you consider the overall cohort, was about 438, meaning that mostly advanced advanced stages. And most of the patients we see in our practice, they come with very advanced, unfortunate advanced disease, when we cannot uh, unfortunately propose any more creative that, uh, treatment. Can we cure localized prostate cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa? I would say I would want say yes. Yes, we can in many countries. In many countries like uh, Ghana, Senegal, you know, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, many of them are now having program with urologists uh, that have been trained to perform at least proper radical prostatectomy, radical, uh, perineal, or retropubic. Unfortunately. None of the teams I said that are not, not doing now or open, or laparoscopic. It's almost all uh, open prostatectomy. And we have having now radiotherapy facilities in many of the West African and South African countries like Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon, Ghana, Mali, Mauritania, Nigeria has been good facilities. So in combining uh, um, uh, linear accelerator radiation therapy and uh, surgery, we can provide service to many patients. And I think that we're going to learn from what is happening now with it uh, locked down uh, uh, because of uh, COVID-19 that cannot allow anybody to fly out. Maybe we can learn from that and maybe try to provide the quality services in Africa instead of having people flying to Europe or flying to India or to America to seek for treatment. The status in uh, Radio trap in Africa is a very uh, variable too. About only 20, 23, 23 to uh, out of 54, not 52, 
counties have radiation therapy in Africa. And I think this is something we should work on to definitely improve the quality of, of radiation therapy in Africa. And I said that some countries like Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Mauritania, Senegal, even Rwanda has a very nice center now are working toward having these facilities available for this population. And this is the measure of the Butaro Center, cancer center in Rwanda. And one is coming up in Senegal very soon. Cote d'Ivoire has a very nice one in Abidjan. And I think each of these countries now is now trying to get at least one different center for cancer, for comprehensive cancer treatment in the country. That is the way to go. The challenge here is with locally advanced and metastasis posted cancer in Africa uh, because of the limited resources to conform with international guidelines. There are no guidelines uh, to take care of those patients in our subregion because of lack of infrastructure, lack of uh, uh, trained uh, pro health providers, and sometimes lack of availability of, uh, of, of, of uh, adjuvant treatment. Antigen uh, deprivation therapy is available, but is most unfortunately very costly in many, many countries. <clears throat> One box of bicatilamid in uh, Senegal costs about $90, $90 for one month. And if you go for any injection, it goes to like $200. So the, uh, the, the patient has to pay for like uh, $250 to $300 a month. And unfortunately, there's no uh, insurance there's no universal health coverage, and people have, have to pay out of their pocket, which makes it very, very difficult. Surgical castration, uh, like uh, bilateral orchiectomy, could be the cheapest alternative, but unfortunately, it's not accepted, or not very accepted in many parts of Africa. Many men decline the procedure for fear of losing their virility, and they don't feel not being a male anymore, but they say if they get castrated, that's why it's very difficult to have it as a routine procedure to propose to patients coming to us with advanced prostate cancer. And even men who undergo surgical castration uh, and will live a little longer stand the risk of developing castration, uh, castration prostate cancer. And we don't have, unfortunately, the other new treatment to provide to them. There are some lack of equity to access anti-male cancer treatment. Like recommended uh, treatment like docetaxel is very expensive. And in uh, Senegal, my country, the docetaxel, the first line treatment is free for the women with breast cancer, but it's not free for male who have prostate cancer, which is something we should look at it and work. We are, we are, we are working to, to bring more equity in cancer treatment in our subregion. And these are the challenges with metastasis are still the option of uh, do giving, meta, uh, how to call it, uh, docetaxel or other abiraterone to the patient. It's not available, but if it is, unfortunately it is not, uh, people cannot afford it because it's very expensive sitting in our camp. It's a very small market that the pharma companies uh, don't see, don't, don't see, uh, interest, look, uh, see interest in providing this. In, this, in, in our subdivision. But the main problem is that Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, especially, is not to producing the drug we need. And uh, only, um, on, only, only two, three percent of the global drugs are pro produced in Africa. And I was saying earlier that the global lockdown because of COVID-19 pandemic should be a wake-up call to African countries to develop drug industries nationally originally. If you go to South Africa or to Morocco in North Africa, which is different of what I'm talking about in Sub-Saharan Africa, they are producing much more drugs and uh, in, the, in their subdivision, like going from 70 to 80 percent of the drug they use. And uh, because of they are now trying to restart all the pharmaceutical, um, uh, how to call it, industries to provide or to, to, to produce uh, chloroquine in uh, many of the countries, I hope that after that, we're gonna now start producing the drugs we need in our sub-region. Palliative care for advanced cancer, prostate cancer is very, it's, it's not well distributed in Africa. Uganda was, I think, up front with uh, Hospice Uganda, who started with our friend, uh, Dr. Anne Merriman, 
who have done a very good job there. And according to African Palliative Care, I've seen Africa, country like Senegal, Ghana, Uganda, Mauritania, like uh, Cameroon, Nigeria, have initiated pain control for patients with moderate uh, price, but it is still modest price, but still sometimes very expensive and not affordable for many patients. And those countries I mentioned have also capacity for palliative care radiotherapy for pain control in patients with bone metastasis due to prostate cancer. In summary, as regard to prostate cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa, I can say that CAP is certainly more frequent than reported. It is much more uh, uh, higher than what it is reported. The aggressivity seems to be high in respect to the projected mortality. And due to lack of comprehensive early detection program, I think that the CAP diagnosis is often made at an advanced stage. But hopefully, in our practice now, we are seeing mail coming much more earlier, coming just to say, okay, I heard about this problem and I want to get a PSA or whatever to for early diagnosis. And I think it's uh, hopefully we'll soon be able to get patients much earlier and to be able to provide creative treatment. The other topic would be is, uh, bladder cancer, but I'm gonna just go on some peculiarities of bladder cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa. We know that bladder cancer is mostly uh, mostly um, the traditional carcinoma in many places of the world, like in the Americas, in Europe, and even in the Egypt where it used to be mostly just a uh, squamous cell carcinoma. The figure is now changing because of, uh, of smoking. And there are some evidence-based factors I would like to develop in this part of my talk. Uh, Schisto and bladder cancer has been associated for a long time, and in Egypt, it has been uh, testified that in mummies, they have been seen. And the schistosomiasis is used to be a very big problem, and uh, mainly in places in Africa where numerous irrigation projects uh, have been developed, and the increase of the population around that project uh, led to higher exposure to, to the parasites. And based on uh, WHO data in 19, in 20, to 2016, at least uh, two, more than 200 million people were in need of schistosomiasis uh, treatment. And uh, West Africa and Central Africa are place where the prevalence is, is, is very high. And uh, where unfortunately the complication of schistosomiasis are being seen too. And on the bladder, schistosomiasis has some effects, not only the calcification that will lead to obstruction of the lower upper urinary and the upper urinary tract, meaning this big urethrohydronephrosis that will lead to renal deficiency, but it will end up changing the bladder mucosa and unfortunately it's some inflammation that can bring some fibrosis that will lead, that lead to, to, to bladder cancer. And this form of bladder cancer are very aggressive, and we still see them. We not unfortunately, hopefully, most of the cases now are becoming uh, uh, are coming for uh, transitional cell carcinoma. But we still have some uh, squamous cell carcinoma that are very aggressive and very quickly muscle uh, muscle invasive, and these are very difficult to take care of. And, and this is this is a uh, uh, so there are some uh, measures that I get from my colleague and friend, it's from courtesy of Professor Yal, from my hospital, who show some eggs of schistosoma into the, the world. And the association of uh, uh, bladder cancer in schistosoma has been well studied mainly in Egypt, where even the Bilashia has been de described in the early 90s by Theodore uh, Bilas, and at the Cairo Institute, it was estimated in some winter study done in the early 70s that uh, many patients who came for bladder cancer had it associated with schistosomiasis. And it's still, in another study coming from 78 to 79, it was the same in Egypt too. And bladder cancer so was the number one cancer in the area of a higher epidemic of schistosomiasis. And even not only in Egypt, where the study, when the study has been conducted, 
but the men even in other countries like in Iraq, in Malawi, in Zambia, and recently my colleague and friend Kasunde Boa uh, presented one study at the Aten meeting and in Kuwait and in Senegal. When I was resident in the mid 80s at that time, we used to have about 47 to 50 percent of all bladder cancer who came to our department were associated with cystic cystic but now it's coming it's, it's becoming more and more uh, most le, 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 less 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 common and in contrast of that in country free of cystic the body cancer is back behind it's not number one but is ranked fifth to seventh of the incidence of in the same period The histopathologic uh, findings associated with schizophrenias are uh, uh, very um, characteristic. Like in a study of 30 out of 90 Egyptian patients with histopathologic who had the bladder transial submutation in exon 5 to 8 on the P53 gene. And this is the review of uh, the bladder cancer in my, in my hospital where I work with the pathology department. But from like uh, uh, 2013 to 2018, a total of 150 patients with cancer, uh, bladder cancer, uh, bladder cancer specimen was seen, and the 21 cases were associated with schizophrenia, meaning 40 percent of the bladder cancer in the in the in the hospital in the, in, in in Dakar uh, had schizophrenia associated bladder cancer, which is still a little high. And most of, if you now uh, look at the, the, the pathologic finding of the bladder cancer, mostly it was squamous cell carcinoma, as I said initially, transitional carcinoma for 10 percent, and adenocarcinoma for 25 percent. There are some limitations in understanding the association of schistosomiasis and bladder cancer in sub-Saharan Africa. Because of the lack of tractable animal model to study the progression of urogenital schistosomiasis, we know much more about the other complications like the obstruction of the urinary tract, the, the, the destruction of the, of, of the kidney, the pyonephrosis, and all those, and, the, but, and the, the destructive bladder that we still have from time to time, then definitely the, the, the oncogenesis of schistosomia on the bladder. There are some limited genomic information about schistosoma hematobium. A limited genetic test tool to manipulate life stage of schistosoma hematobium. An incomplete catalog of mutation that may be specific to human schistosoma bladder cancer compared to other bladder cancer. In summary for bladder cancer, there are or there is evidence to support the association between schistosoma and bladder cancer. The magnitude of the evidence is, however, limited. Uh, limited. Uh, bladder cancer pathology has evolved, and uh, hopefully, in West Africa and South Africa, we are having much more pathologists that are interested in working on urogenital malignancies. But there is need for more genomic and molecular research to better characterize schistosoma hematobium and its effect on the bladder. So we have gone through two main uh, cancers in, uh, that we see in Sub-Saharan Africa and the urology department that I deal, we deal with as a urologist, mainly prostate cancer that is coming up that will be very soon maybe number one cancer in our subdivision, and bladder cancer that is number one of our admission for cancer because uh, in, in, my, in my hospital they come mostly very late where we cannot do anything but get them into the hospital. And to deal with this, we need to train health workers to provide the services. And unfortunately, as I said initially, if you compare the northern part of Africa and, and South Africa to the sub-Saharan Africa, we see that that lack of program, there's no established oncology training program. You have some medical oncology program in Cote d'Ivoire, in, uh, in, in uh, Congo Brazzaville, we have in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in Senegal, we have one uh, surgical oncology program in Senegal, that is the only one I know about. There is no one in the West African subdivision. That's why the West African College of Surgeons is trying to work with partners to, to, to develop a curriculum for surgical oncology. Because many of these patients 
it can uh, 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 can be operated, can be curable if you provide surgical service very early. And these are the needs for to, to take care of those patients. For number one, we need to have population-based education to establish cancer infrastructure. We don't have any choice now, and we have to learn from what is happening now. Nobody can travel, nobody can go out, in and out because of the COVID-19 lockdown. We need to have laboratory nomogram for African men, the guidelines and laboratory standards. We don't know when you say PSA nomogram norms is a 2.5 cutoff or four. When has it been uh, demonstrated to Africa? You don't know. Maybe we need to know what is really the normal PSA in a, in a, in, a, in a population in sub-Saharan Africa. We need to train surgical oncologists. And for that, for that, we need to set international collaboration, to have kind of exchange program. We need to organize on-site hands-on workshop and mentorship. That's why I'm going to talk quickly about an initiative that is an initiative for surgical oncology training in Africa. That is an initiative to improve surgical care, oncology training care in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is aiming to address the deficiency of local expertise and of acute surgical centers in sub-Saharan Africa. This can be a collaborative uh, effort between colleges, uh, universities, international cancer organization, societies, and corporates to develop programs aiming to training uh, doctors, uh, staff members, healthcare providers in selected regional uh, centers. And the College of Surgeons, I'm going to quickly walk you into what is the college. The College of Surgeons of West Africa is the very first college in West Africa. It was founded in 1960 as the Association of Surgeons of West Africa. And uh, the college uh, uh, is Anglophone, uh, Francophone, and Lusophone, and goes from Mauritania uh, to DRC. So it's a very, the, 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 the catchment area is very large. 23 member countries, and which mission is to promote a Pan-African special manpower uh, development through education, research, accreditation, examination to our programs in cooperation with a similar organization, appropriate uh, periodic publication and policy formulation. The college uh, has uh, two exam sessions in April and in October. We have mid-years uh, meetings in July, and uh, we are about 8,000 fellows in Africa, in Europe, mainly in UK and the United States and Canada. The objective is the promotion, organization, and conduct of postgraduate education in surgery, the fostering and coordination of education in surgery. When you say surgery, it's not appropriate because the college is bigger than surgery. You're going to see it later. And we collaborate with national, uh, national and international organization. And uh, we uh, prepare publication and we participate in our meetings. We just hopefully finish our annual meeting in February before the pandemic uh, outbreak. The college has seven faculties, anesthesia, ophthalmology, oral, dental surgery, surgery, including urology, general surgery, plastic surgery, orthopedic and traumatology, plastic, neurosurgery, and cardiothoracic surgery, and obstetric and gynecology and radiology. So all surgeons are under the same umbrella. That's why I think that the college is a very good place to start that initiative of training surgeons, whatever specialties, to be able to do, to provide good quality uh, oncology uh, service. Because the rationale behind that is that, uh, according to this publication from Lancet in 2015, uh, surgery should be an essential component for global cancer care and should not be ne ne neglected. The statement is ne of need is because despite population being approximately more than 1 billion, and we having this transition epidemiology, having non-communicable disease more prevalent in the continent, we are lacking of surgical care providers, and we need it because many African countries don't have even doesn't have even one specialist in surgical oncology. We recently held a joint workshop with the College of Surgeons 
of East and South Africa in Maputo during the AOT meeting. And we think that we can collaborate between COSEXA, West African Resurgence, and other colleges natural in the continent, outside the continent, to start having this, this program. The idea is to address the vast need of for quality surgical oncology training uh, in throughout sub-Saharan Africa in educating uh, surgeons from various countries, their respective sub-region, and that we help to advance training to build the capacity and to focus on regional hubs rather in any country. So if you come to West Africa, West Africa is composed of about uh, 15 countries under the umbrella of economic community of West African states, ECOWAS. And uh, among those 15 countries, five speaks English, Nigeria, Ghana, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and the Gambia. Two speak Port Portuguese, Guinea-Bissau, and, uh, Guinea, and, um, and uh, Cap, Verde, Cap Verde, and the others, the eight remaining countries speak French. So we can organize regionally this training. So the Francophone go together, the Lusophone go together, and the Anglophone go together. But our college is beyond West Africa. It goes to Central Africa too. So we have Cameroon, Chad, Congo, DRC, all those counties can be grouped in one and you can have three, four different regions where we can start this kind of uh, training. These are the specific areas of need for surgical oncology training. First of all, anybody going into surgical training oncology, oncology training should know about the principle of surgical oncology, about the perioperative care, organ site cancer management, the reconstruction after cancer surgery, but train them into minimal invasive surgery, MIS, for like endoscopy, laparoscopy, maybe, maybe very soon robotic surgery in Africa. Nobody knows. And these are the three pillars we should develop. I, the three colors is not, uh, it's not, it's, it's not a hazard because it's a green, yellow, and red. Uh, today is Independence Day in Senegal, my country, and Senegal flag is green, yellow, and red. So we need first to set priorities, establish the priority set. We are now establishing collaboration. We have signed with the Royal College of Surgeons and physicians uh, and surgeons in Canada and have started talk and conversation with a group of oncologists in at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, that are willing to work with the college, but the college is open to other organizations to see how we can develop together a sweet a curriculum that uh, will that, that will be adjusted to our need in Africa. And then we're gonna start now building capacity in the regard of providing surgical oncology services throughout the West African and East African and South African subregion. The COVID-19 lockdown has learned as taught us how to use distant learning tools. Now everybody is on distant learning platform, online course and simulation. And I think it will be used widely and maybe organized from time to time some hands-on training workshop in county on site but the distance learning tool could be an appropriate way to start this kind of partnership. And using some simulation, we have started in urology years ago with some simulators. This is an image of one consultant urologist now working in Nigeria under the supervision of my colleague, Dr. Jalo in blue, and teaching them how to do a proper uh, a, a TURP and a simulator, that we can use this kind of simulator for many other procedures. And I've started some, initi some, some initiative in bilateral in urology, like the D4D initiative, the Doris and Fordaka, with my friend, Dr. Albert Runes, who is a urologist in the, in the United States, we started, we are able to train many African doctors, urologists coming from Nigeria, from Ghana, from other places, to come to come to learn how to do uh, appropriate a proper a radical posterectomy, and this started more than ten years ago, and almost all urology in the subdivision are now able to do is open radical posterectomy by uh, through retropubic or perineal retropubic posterectomy, and this is a double 
collaboration with our colleague, Dr. Jalo, who able to go and observe in the United States. This is a way to go, a double collaboration for, for faculty from Africa to go in the more developed country to see what is going on there, and the other colleague coming in Africa to teach people on site. That will help reach much more people as if uh, better than if we send one by one people to go to anywhere in Europe or in the United States. Anything that we can set the collaboration or this thing around the concept original center for capacity building. And if you set like this, this center should be a center where a surgical training unit with dry lab simulators, working station mannequin, a basic surgical skill lab, e-health application, telemedicine, telehealth, surgical research unit with clinical research, protocol development, ground writing, patient material, surgical unit with enough case load. And all this can be organized around what you can call the uh, regional capacity building center. In summary, we need to improve awareness on cancer and role of surgery as essential component of cancer treatment throughout Africa. We need to train manpower to increase ancient capacity uh, nationally and regionally to establish internet partnership with enable current training activities to grow and new activities to develop. And this will increase the regional capacity to meet one of the greatest healthcare and development challenges in Sub-Saharan Africa. The way forward will be to mobilize the stakeholders of cancer care on the continent to support prostate cancer, urological cancer, urological malignancy, and cancer in general and to engage pharmaceutical partners for local production of chemotherapic agents, chemotherapic agents to reduce cost. And as I said, we should learn from this COVID-19 pandemic that is uh, definitely locking down all the world globally. We should stimulate a consensus statement guideline that's applicable to what Africa still further prospective trials are, are conducted. And I do think that the global growth should start with local expertise. And I thank you very much. This oh. is the end of my lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gwai. At this point, um, uh, if anyone has any questions for Professor Gwai, please ask them now. Uh, this is where, so thank you so much. That was a wonderful lecture. And I, I think, uh, especially with COVID-19, we want to thank you very much that you took time out to, to give this lecture. Um, you know, obviously, I think this is a really good lecture that we will want to share um, with many other people uh, beyond who didn't, were not able to attend the class. Um, one question I had was on the, you mentioned about the rise in prostate cancer in Africa. Um, do you know what the cause for this is? Why, why is this increase in prostate cancer? Actually, thank you very much for the question. And actually, the rise is, is, is obvious because Africans are living much longer. In the, in the early, in the end of okay. 19, in the end of 90s, most of the African countries in the sub-Saharan Africa, the life expense was about 40 something to 50. Country like Senegal in 2006, life expense was 60 global. And now it's now 75, uh, 70, uh, 67 for male, it's 69 for women and 65.5 for men. So life expense is improving. In South mm -hmm. Africa, that was by HIV for ages. Now life expense is now 64. But unfortunately, some countries like Niger is lacking behind is still 53. But since Africans are living longer, since they are much more informed about the prostate cancer and they're going much more to seek for services, I think we will discover prostate cancer much more. Yeah. That really makes sense. Um, and for leaders like you who are really doing a lot, I think I would imagine with uh, very little resources there, what are the main challenges that you face, um, you know, in, in addressing surgical cancer and urology in general? 
the main challenge, as I said, is unfortunately most of the patients, many patients are coming very late where they are not, where they are no more amenable to any creative surgery. This is one challenge. Uh, uh, number two is not only for Senegal. Senegal is doing much better now. In 2000, when I was moving, moving out of the hospital, I was working to go to the hospital I'm working now. We had only one urology unit in the country. Now we have 21 urology units everywhere in the country. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, in many places, there are few urologists, and the urologists are all concentrated in the big cities, in the capitals, and mm -hmm. very difficult to reach. And unfortunately, the patient cannot reach them. And some of the urologists were trained earlier, and unfortunately, they don't go to refreshment courses to be able now to provide proper oncology services. And mm. I think this is the main issue of training uh, uh, human resources to be able to take care of the patient surgically and to provide information yeah. to the community so they can come early when it is his time to provide surgical service properly. Yeah, and that makes sense. You know, you need to have more urologists and, and healthcare professionals, um, you know, as the surge comes, as the prostate cancer cases increase. Um, and then as you create awareness and people begin to come, you, we want to be able to be ready. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much. Makes sense. Do we have any further questions for Professor Gwai? Uh, yes. Uh, good evening, Professor Gwai. Thank you for the, the presentation. Uh, I wish to uh, ask if... Um, Adding to the training of uh, urologists, like in Sub-Saharan Africa, knowing that um, most of the first, um, the first line doctor are general practitioner, and most of the time that the ones seeing the patient as, as well, will it be a way to say that the education part, especially on oncology red flag, um, on the undergraduate level, should be a component of trying to avoid this late uh, stage appearance of uh, cases uh, to the urologist. Um, the second question I wanted to ask is, uh, I was happy to, you mentioned um, e-learning as one of the methods to reduce this uh, barrier. But what are the main challenges that uh, not peculiar to Senegal, um, like other countries are facing to really implement these uh, e-learning uh, tools, which are now like, especially with the COVID-19, putting us, everybody in the same uh, loop. What are the main challenges those countries are facing to implement those tools, which can actually be something very useful and um, for that training? Thank you very much. I think that for the first question, you're right, and we just no, don't, don't stop only on the, 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 the even the undergraduate students, but for the nurses and everybody should be, I think it should be compulsory to give some kind of uh, oncology education to all, all, all health service, uh, health care providers at any level in the nursing schools, in the, in the social, social workers, and uh, for undergraduates, medical doctor medical uh, school uh, students for them to know about cancer in general and know about uh, especially um neurological malignancies so they will be able to refer to other doctor other specialists very um, uh, uh, how to call it uh, um, earlier or sooner the number two the the main challenges in um, in providing or having these distant learning tools in Africa is almost the same as uh, all the obstacles to accessing universal health services, through, uh, uh, services. And most of them is, uh, one of them is lack of electricity. You have some counties, electricity coming maybe four hours a day. I do a lot of outreach in many countries. Sometimes you have electricity uh, from uh, maybe eight in the morning to 12, and then maybe from uh, six to, to, to eight, and then no more electricity. Number two, access to internet services. And uh, we are very grateful in Senegal. I think the internet access is one of the best 
not only in Africa, but in Senegal, we are very grateful. Electricity is here, we don't lack of electricity very often, but unfortunately, many sub-Saharan African countries are lacking of electricity, and they are like, the equipment is not a problem, because anybody in Africa has a smartphone, actually. But I think that one is the will and the wish and the of the of the of the of the of the of the, of the government to to definitely go into that. Now in Senegal, while I'm speaking, all the schools are closed, universities closed. But even on TV now we have classes. The primary school boys are staying home now and getting cool from the TV every day. So this is something we should maybe explore for ages. And if you have done it maybe earlier, the boys would not spend all day at school outside. So I think that we should look at it properly. It will help us. Thank you.